archaeologist, I'm not a historian or a heritage expert or even an amateur field walker, so you can throw me out now if you like. Aside from my lay enthusiasm, my interest in this conference and the reason I'm here comes at a kind of a bleak angle really, a side shoot of my practice as a creative writer, as a novelist in Perth. Perhaps the most obvious link between what I do and what those of you in the archaeological community here do is an explanation of the narrative possibilities of place. As a writer, I'm inspired and intrigued by place. I enjoy the potential of open spaces that have been cultivated by generations, of fields containing the lost footprints of buildings, of grand structures that have fallen and resurfaced, been adapted or readopted. I like to get close to edges, the touch flint perimeters and plastered surfaces, peer into alcoves, climb perilous platforms, and to seek out the unexpected. And hopefully this is going to show you No? Sorry. It's no longer unexpected because you're waiting for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll carry on talking. It's not that I feel the need to write about these things, although I have, but rather that I find the way we shape our environment and are shaped by it endlessly fascinating. A high wall demands our curiosity. What is being kept out or kept in? An abandoned dwelling is ripe with imaginative possibility. Who lived there? Where did they go? Why? Why has no one moved in? The writer asks these questions and, based on their reading of the world, presents answers in the form of story. When the archaeologist asks the same questions and interprets through their reading of the world, they present answers in the form of history. Both ways of seeing and interpreting place require curiosity, creativity, and perhaps most importantly, a willingness to look closely at that which is often overlooked. My writing and practice-based research has steadily developed into a form of psychogeography, walking in search of materials and details, but also to question, to notice, to power up the writing batteries. I use psychogeographical approaches in my teaching too, encouraging students to engage attentively with place in order to sharpen up their descriptive skills and develop their power of noticing. I've become increasingly aware that this approach also lends itself to the exploration of historic sites, the disruptive walk of psychogeography can burst the bubble of cosy heritage tourism, just as it was once used to see through the society of the spectacle. Psychogeography, and forgive me if you already know this, is rooted in the radical experiments of the Situationist International and their precursors, including the Darwinists <coughs> and the Letrist movements in Paris. It was defined by Guy de Boer, that quarrelsome grandfather of psychogeography, as the study of the specific effects of geographical environment whether consciously organised or not, on the emotions and behaviour of individuals. At the heart of psychogeography is the derive or drift, an attentive walk, or a technique of rapid passage through varied ambiences. We did quite a lot of that on the field trip yesterday. Psychogeography is concerned with how we respond to place. We're influenced by our surroundings, consciously or otherwise. Urban areas are rife with signage, street layouts and advertisements that pummel us with demands and commands. Rather than allowing themselves to be dictated to in this way, zoning out and following the path of least resistance, psychodrophers will question those messages and possibly refuse them. This is the disruptive aspect of psychodrography, the situationist's desire to react against the spectacle of municipal authority and obviously walk the other way. Since its Parisian roots, psychodrography has been considered a primarily urban pursuit, the psychogeographical approaches can easily be transposed to the rural and semi-rural. We may not feel the need to resist the siren call of capitalism in Kirkwall, but we can still walk with psychogeographical attitude. We can do this anywhere. Simply by stopping, looking, questioning, slowing down, looking up, looking down, reversing, going off track, and generally following our curiosity, we can experience place more fully and attend to it on many levels. The derive or drift is the act of walking in this way, of expecting more from moving through place than the process of getting from one point to another. But don't confuse this with the actions of the rambler, the tourist walker. This is what Phil Smith has to say about those. Rambling is stuck in a Newtonian vision of clockwork nature, there to be observed, maybe even appropriated, but rarely to be tangled with. 
The walker is kitted up and separated out from the terrain, encountering its nature less by immersion and risk, and more through picturesque vistas represented in and preempted by a guidebook. Against this, psychogeographers offered an intense and risky practice of walking and reimagining space, a setting of ourselves at the mercy of spaces, a changing of spaces as we move through them. As soon as we put our mark on the landscape, dwell in it, farm it, and leave traces, urban psychogeographers may have the richest pickings, walking through place that has been shaped and reshaped for thousands of years. Is Ivan Chechdlov, hard to say, I'll say that again, Ivan Chechdlov, a precursor of the situation is pointed out. All cities are geological. You can't take three steps without encountering ghosts bearing all the prestige of their legends. We move within a closed landscape whose landmarks constantly draw us towards the past. I would argue that these landmarks exist in the rural landscape too. As long as there is a level of habitation or the memory of it, we stake a claim to these places. And where the memory is too distant, we interpret. We tell stories of place. Legends attach themselves. Here there used to be a bakery. That's where old Lady Dupois used to live. It is striking here that the places people live in are like the presences of diverse absences. What can be seen designates what is no longer there. You see, here they used to be, but it can no longer be seen. Although Deserto's text here is concerned with Paris, we can apply this way of reading the past to the most rural community. Here there used to be a barn. That's where the priests used to live. You see, that's where the driveway is. De Certo continues, places of fragmentary and inward turning histories, pasts that others are not allowed to read, accumulated times that can be unfolded, are like stories held in reserve, remaining in an enigmatic state. Sites where memory can no longer be directly accessed are such enigmatic places. These stories held in reserve require an interpreter, someone willing to look at and interrogate the place to unpack and retell the stories. De Serta also refers to place as palimpsest, a metaphor that I'm rather disappointed, but I suppose heartened to discover I wasn't the first to use. A town, was, a town wall built and rebuilt over hundreds of years, a desire path marked by generations of walkers taking the same shortcut between villages. These are concrete instances of palimpsest. Noticing them can change the way we look at a place and the way we behave in and around that place. By being attentive to these, to their laser time and use, we can begin to unpick the past and perhaps understand it more fully. So how can we adopt psychogeographical practices to enhance our experience of historic and heritage sites, rural and urban? <coughs> Established in 1997, Rights and Sites, a site-specific performance company and collective of artists researchers devised a practice of disruptive walking rooted in psychogeography and Dada. Their approach to collaborative experience, intervention and spatial meaning making crystallised into what founding member Phil Smith, who's also known as Crabman, and I'll let you work out why, has termed mythogeography. We've been exploring the potential of an approach to place through the lens of mythogeography that places the fictional, fanciful, mistaken and personal on equal terms with factual municipal history. Rights and Sites developed this eclectic but democratic approach to interpreting place with the creation of site-specific mist guides, guided performance walks and publications. A mist guide to anywhere published in 2006 took the form of a series of provocations and instructions for walks designed to inject psychogeography into everyday experiences of place. As well as instructions for virtual walks, cities under curfew or exploring boundaries, and this guide to anywhere includes instructions for visiting museums and games. One set of instructions the exhibitionist aims to liven up visits to predominantly static, silent, passive places where people graze and gaze in a general way. Instructions include ignoring the displays and focusing on the furniture or other visitors, or establishing a pattern of switching from an open to a focused gaze while, cons while considering displays. <laughs> Another instruction recommends visiting grand nationalistic monuments as if they were garden monuments. Or to encounter memorials not in silence, but by reading aloud all the inscriptions for the normally unspoken. With these instructions, a misguide to anywhere dips the toe in counter-tourism, an area that Phil Smith has expanded upon in his recent practice 
more than that in a moment. Counter-tourism has its origins in another French movement, Latterex, the Laboratory of Experimental Tourism, which was established by Jean-Henri in 1990. Latterex draws upon the practices of the Situationists, Dada and Ulipo, employing games, using constraints, randomness and chance, and integrating psychogeographical approaches to discover new ways of seeing other places. But rather than being a mockery of tourism or the tourist, Latterex's counter-tourism embraces travel much as mythogeography embraces place. All experiences are equally valid. In The Lonely Planet Guide to Experimental Travel, which is sadly out of print, Henri and his collaborator Rachel Anthony define counter-tourism as a game. Counter-tourism is not intended as a critique of classical tourism. Rather, it's simply an invitation to travel differently. Counter-tourism is a great game to play at key tourist sites, where you may, may feel most pressured to play the role of tourist and conform to prescribed activities and expectations. Counter-tourism can also turn a negative into a positive. Suddenly, all those tourists blocking your view of Big Ben become not an invitation, but a plus. The guide's instructions for a counter-touristic activity include <coughs> photographing tourists, taking photographs of the site visited rather than the site itself, or deliberately doing the opposite of any advice given in the site's guidebook. The parallels with psychogeographical practices at large, and rights and sites misguide in particular, are apparent. Phil Smith's adoption of counter-tourism is effectively a heritage site-specific development of the misguide. Counter-tourism the handbook and its pocketbook companion directly address the application of psychogeography to heritage. Smith's books react against the packaging of heritage sites and the sanitising effect of the heritage industry. This is herit heritage as spectacle, or heritage with a J, as Smith calls it. Counter Tourism, the handbook, announces itself as a book for those who want more from heritage sites than a tea shop and an old thing in a glass case. Smith offers the reader tactics and guiding principles to use on a personal journey through the heritage tourism machine. He recommends prowling around the heritage industry much as a counter-terrorist agent would in the early camp, enjoying its mistakes and omissions and gently misdirecting things in the interests of revelation. Again, there is a situationist desire to disobey perceived authority and prescribed modes of behaviour. But Smith maintains the benevolent, if slightly mischievous, Latterex approach. The mockery is gentle and genuine appreciation for the sites and the past they give access to are at the root of the movement. Counter-tourism is all about tripping yourself up with pleasure and falling down the rabbit hole to discover places and experiences that the heritage industry conceals or ignores. Buried ballrooms, accidental islands, hidden histories, the spirit of place in the wood of the site, mass graves and inconvenient details, the power of things, and the fossil of the future. While disruptive in a psychogeographical sense, Smith's instructions are not intended to interfere with the experience of others or to pose a nuisance to the site or its custodians. Rather, this brand of counter-tourism aims to look beyond the shrink wrap notion <coughs> of the past often presented at sites of historic interest and to attend to its many layers instead. Heritage renders the extraordinary ordinary, Smith warns, so to get special back, try to focus entirely on the site. Smith's instructions disrupt the viewer's behaviour, posing questions, provoking responses, and enabling a diverse and thus richer experience of place. There are only two ways you can do these, tactic bad, these tactics badly, Smith says, hurt yourself or reduce other people's pleasure. Counter Tories in the Pocketbook offers a redacted version of the handbook with 50 odd things to do in a heritage site, all of which are playful yet respectful and many of which will genuinely enrich the experience of visiting a site, particularly with children. Here are some examples. Visit heritage sites as if you were members of a bomb disposal team. Move very, very carefully. Be extremely tentative about accepting any of the information on offer. Assess the site's potential for eruption. Assume there are booby traps. In a heritage site, ignore all signs and labels and follow the flows of air or a sequence of colours or navigate just by what feels most attractive most intense or most foreboding. Let the atmosphere of the property and the shapes of its landscape, not its information boards, draw you around it. Use the official site map upside down. 
One might imagine that those in the heritage industry would feel rather uncomfortable about this approach, but my experience has been quite the opposite. This summer I began to infiltrate English heritage, and they were willing and aware, uh, with psychogeographical practices and counter-tourism. I ran a training workshop with newly recruited volunteers at Walmart Castle in Kent, using Dereef-based approaches to exploring the site and defamiliarising exercises with objects, both designed to encourage creative ways of experiencing buildings and artefacts. Volunteers then presented misguided tours of the items and spaces in the castle to each other, using creative interpretation to enhance their storytelling. As well as being a playful tool for bonding new recruits, the skills developed through the workshop could be transferred to the room of ro the role of room guide, making this more entertaining for the volunteers as well as for the visitor. The session provided creative techniques for dealing with potentially underwhelmed visitors, especially families, and ways of making essentially hands off with to experience more interactive. As an extension of this, I've begun working with a small team of curatorial interpretation staff from English Heritage. Our brief is to improve the visitor experience for families at St Augustine's Abbey in Canterbury, which is part of the Wild Heritage site. Counter-tourist approaches are integral to the project, bringing playful and imaginative processes of exploration to improve visitors' understanding of the site, that now in ruins, in a field, has undergone numerous waves of use, neglect and redevelopment. I live in Sandwich in Kent, a medieval sink port. I've heard Sandwich described as both perfectly preserved and a stuck in aspic. Standing in the town's guild hall forecourt this summer, waiting for a bus, I overheard a group of tourists as they crossed the narrow street. It's not really rural, is it? One of them remarked. Sandwich has a population of around 5,000, four schools, a market, various places of worship, plenty of pubs, and yes, two golf courses. According to the 2011 Rural Urban Classification for Local Authority Districts in English, so it must be true, Sandwich falls into an area designated Urban with Significant Rural. It's under the auspices of Dover District Council and narrowly escaped being represented by UKIP in the last general election. A walk of 30 minutes could take you in one direction, across one of the golf courses to the sea, and in another, through orchards and crop fields to farm buildings and country pubs. Like most semi-rural places, it isn't easy to define. This makes it perfect for the psychogeographer. There are residential spaces to interrogate, municipal signage to disobey, historic sites to explore, and footpaths to get lost on. So I find it endlessly fascinating. One thing Sandwich isn't very good at is tourism. There are some information boards that connect with the town trail, and the local history society offers very knowledgeable guided walks for groups. But I wanted to create a counter-tourist approach to Sandwich, something that looked deeper than the picture postcard views of Keyside and Jetty Building. The result of my plan was a project called Walking Heritage, funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and supported by my institute, Canterbury Christ Church University. Over the summer, I worked with community volunteers, the Sandwich Local History Society, representatives, representatives from English Heritage and the RGS Discovery Britain Project, and to my great delight, Phil Smith himself, to create a series of alternative guided walks in site-specific interpretive literature. These included a misguide of sorts, walking sideways in sandwich, with provocation and walking games, a tour of lost pubs, a safari for families, and the Not the Blue Black Tour of Sandwich, which is essentially a mythogeographic self-led walking tour of town heritage, myth and rumour. My aim when applying counter-tourism to historic sites is to offer a reading of place beyond the prescribed, one which builds upon existing expert knowledge. By experiencing place through and beyond the lens of existing interpretations, the visitor is closer to the historian, archaeologist, novelist or poet, applying an open, creative and investigative mind to the reading of place and past. Thank you.